Let's open with our Shout with Delight song. So if you're not awake yet, let's wake up. Shout with Delight, hymn 108 from Hymns Modern and Ancient. Psalm 71, in you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness and cause me to escape. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be strong, be my strong refuge to which I may resort continually. You have given he commandment to save me for you are my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, O my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the righteous and cruel man. For you are my hope, O Lord God, you are my trust from my youth. By you I have been upheld from birth. You are he who took me out of my mother's womb. My praise shall be continually of you. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you today that you are our rock and that, Lord, you have seen fit that we can be part of your flock, Lord. And we just thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, the great shepherd. Lord, the one who knows his sheep by name. And we thank you for that, Lord. And Lord, we are so thankful for just the blessing that you gave last week during Vacation Bible School. And all the children that came out, Lord, and the parents that came out, Lord. And we just thank you and we just pray that it was, that it was a blessing to you. That you were pleased in all that was done, Lord. And we're thankful for what was done in your holy name. And Lord, we just pray today for Dick Kilcup, Lord. And we just ask your blessing on him and Roberta, Lord, and the family. And Lord, you did, we just ask that you would be with him and help him to heal soon and, and return to us, Lord. And we think of uh, others who have been out because of illness, Lord. It's a, it's a blessing to have Miss Jean back with us now. And just thank you that uh, she's okay. And Lord, we think of those who can't be here and just pray for them. And Lord, we just ask that you would just bless this service today, that you would be pleased in all that is done today. And Lord, we are so thankful that you are our God and you are our Savior. And we pray all of this in Jesus' holy name and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. You can remain seated for our new song of the month, My Hope is Jesus.
start that second verse, let's stand. It feels like we should stand for this song. This is a powerful song. What is your hope on the second verse? When darkness hides my Savior's face, I rest on His unchanging grace. When faith is weak and doubt is strong, I still lift up salvation's song. My hope is Jesus. cross of Jesus. i 
Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to have everybody out this morning. I think uh, some of us are probably dragging a little bit from a good week of Vacation Bible School, but nonetheless a tiring one. And uh, with that in mind, I'm going to make an executive decision to cancel church tonight. Um, so don't come tonight at 5.30. Um, we um, uh, just, I, I, my sense is that people are worn out and, um, I mean, you worked hard all week. I do want to thank those those who worked out all week in Vacation Bible School. And of course, some of you, you know, weren't working Vacation Bible School. But um, I just think a time of rest is not a bad idea for uh, for this evening. There's sickness. There's some sickness going around as well that I don't want to see get out of hand as well. So just take some time and rest. Maybe read read scripture with your family uh, tonight. Um, let me. I'm going to encourage you. You're not going to like this, but I'm going to encourage you to do this. Keep the TV off. Just keep the, TV, keep the television off. Read, spend time with your family, play a game with your family, and keep the tele. If you don't, I mean, you don't have to do what I tell you to do. It's just my, just my idea. But, uh, so, but uh, uh, I, I, I will say this. When, this is totally for free. But um, when our, we went on our, our family vacation, I think we turned the TV on twice the whole vacation. Uh, we, watched, uh, we watched the, um, what is that movie we watched? The Jew Fiddler on the Roof, I think. And we broke it up into two parts because it's long um, and kind of slow moving. But anyway, so um, but anyway, so um, uh, but we really did not turn the tube on much, and we just tried to spend time. With it. And it was it, I can tell you it was the most restful, relaxing vacation uh, that we probably had so far. It also helped that our kids were a little older. But 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 anyway, so I I just would encourage you. Um, it's a, it's kind of amazing when you when you okay. I, I'll stop preaching about that now. So. Um, the other thing I do want to ask you to do as well is to be, be in prayer for the Kill Cups and, um, and uh, just encourage you to uh, pray for Dick. He, he did suffer from a stroke yesterday morning and, um, and it, the, 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 the symptoms and things are, are in, you know, as far as what's long term are inconclusive right now. So, so just be in prayer for them uh, just in the next uh, week here particularly. And as Dave already said, in conjunction with that, I, I just like for us to show love to them as a fa as a church family. And if you'd be willing to give a um, just to make a meal for them, uh, Nancy Butel is willing to coordinate that. So if you would just talk with her uh, either after the service or call or email her, uh, that would be very helpful. Um, just to just to show love to them. I, I don't really know, you know, it's, these sort of situations. It's like, what else can you do to show love to people? Um, and, um, you know, it's not, you know, calling and asking questions is not a good idea right now, but we can at least, you know, show love that way. And so I would encourage as a church family to do that um, and see Nancy Butel about that if you're willing to do that. Um, and just the most important thing right now is definitely to pray for them. And I'll continue to update you as things, as things go on here. Gentlemen, if you come forward for the offering. That's a great song, by the way, that, that mo the monthly song, the one that we're doing this month. Our, my hope is in Jesus. You know, I think some of us need that this morning. We need to re remember that our hope is in Jesus. I know there's a lot of cares, some that others don't know about in the body that I'm aware of and others that I'm sure I'm not aware of, but we've got to remember our hope is in Jesus. Uh, let's pray together. Father, as we've already sung this morning, we thank you that our hope is in Christ that he is the author and the finisher of our faith and for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne uh, of your throne. And we're grateful this morning that that through life's roller coaster ride, the ups and the downs, the difficulties and the times of joy and excitement, that you are that steady hand in our lives that is always constant and we admit before you that if we don't recognize that constant hand in our lives, it's because we are, we are vacillating, you are not. That you are always fixed, that you are unchanging, that the, that the change is us, and the change is this fallen world that we live in. But help us, dear Father, to know that Christ, that our hope is in Christ. And as there are various burdens in our midst this morning, things that have been mentioned and others that have not, I just pray, Lord, that you would meet each need, that this service would be a service that would be uplifting, that we would focus on Christ, 
that the gospel of Jesus Christ would be clear in our minds and that we would know uh, that, that no matter what is going on, that your, our hope is secure, our, our future is secure, and we live, in a, we live life in a vapor. This is just a vapor, your word tells us, that we ought to live with eternity in mind to set our affections on things above, not on the things of this world. And so I pray, Lord, that you would help us to do that. And uh, we do specifically pray uh, for the Kill Cups, and we ask that you would just be with them and uh, help them during this time and give them strength. May your presence be very evident to them. Help us as a body of believers, as a family, church family, know how to show love to them. And there are others here as well, Lord, uh, others that I couldn't be with us this morning that are going through difficult things, physical things, Lord, and and um, some of which I'm not able to disclose, but you know each need. <clears throat> and I pray, Lord, that you would, um, you would meet those needs, Lord, and, um, and help uh, in areas of weakness. We know that your word tells us that your strength is made perfect in weakness, that we, we, can, we can actually glory in our infirmities that the power of Christ might rest upon us. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to, to know that not just in our minds, but that we would experience that in our hearts, in our thinking. That we would just know um, that you're, you have the opportunity to, to, to be strong in times, to show us your, your strength in times of weakness. We thank you for this church. We thank you for a wonderful Vacation Bible School. We thank you for the hard work of all of the teachers. Thank you for Kevin and Laurelyn's uh, leadership and, and uh, administration and all of that, Lord. And, our prayer, dear Father, would be that the gospel, though it was preached, for, preached through the week, would, would lodge into the hearts of these kids. That even though we may not see all of the results, that your spirit would work in them and it would awaken them to realize their sin and their need of a savior. Father, we uh, pray for the parents, even those who are here on Friday night that, that perhaps don't know you. And I pray, Lord, that... Um, that you would help them to come to a saving knowledge of you, that the gospel that was spoken through feeble lips would do work that is powerful because of the content of the gospel. And I pray, Lord, that you would, um, you would just take all of this and use it for your purposes and your glory. I pray that you, as we give to you, that you would, uh, you would use what we give uh, for the furtherance of the gospel, both in this community and around the world. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.
his robes for mine. With that in mind, let's stand and sing 665. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. As we begin singing, children are dismissed through the back, down to their classrooms. Stand, stand up for Jesus. Let's sing this out. If you would, turn to Acts chapter 5 this morning. Acts 5. Let's uh, read, we'll read chapter, 12, uh, chapter 5, verses 12 um, through, I think we're just going to read through 21 for now. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that less that at least uh, the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Then the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, which is the sect of of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation, and, and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. When they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. The priest and those with them came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. Uh, we'll, we'll keep reading for a few more verses. 
But when the, when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priests heard these things, they wondered what this outcome would be. So, when came, uh, so one came and told them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers, raising up Jesus, whom you murdered by, by hanging on a tree. Him God exalted to, do, uh, to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this passage that continues to account for us how Christ just continues to build his church. We thank you for the glorious victories that are found in this passage mingled with the suffering of persecution and how the mixture of those things brought about a church that was purified, a church that, that was able to glorify you in the world, and a church that was able to, to spread your gospel all around the world. Father, as we come together this morning and we look at this passage, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to have the kind of spirit in our hearts that is settled about the fact that you are sovereign over all things, that you know how to put people together in certain ways and are able to, um, to, to add to your church and build your church in the way you want to, and also to have a relentless attitude when it comes to giving of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we would be able to persevere through the trials of this life to Keep in mind the focus that we ought to have as we run this race that is set before us. And we ask, dear Father, that as we look to your word this morning, that you would encourage us and strengthen us and challenge us to be great bearers of the gospel for your sake. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. I am curious, how many of you all would say that you really enjoy cooking? How many of you all would actually say that? I actually have to keep my hand down because I don't really, I enjoy eating other people's cooking, but I don't really enjoy it myself. Okay, we've got a, probably a, a few, few people that really enjoy cooking. Um, how many of you all cooks in here have made something and you forgot an ingredient? And when you forgot an ingredient, the thing just, just tasted terribly. Uh, how many of you, I'm just curious, okay, same, okay, all right, got a few of you. Some of you said, I've never done that before, no. Um, or, or put too much of an ingredient in something, uh, like over, over, put something, you know, I'm not a cook, so I don't know, you know, like you, you put twice the amount of sugar in something and came out really sweet or something like that. Well, uh, when we think of Christ and, and how he is building his church, it's, it's amazing that, that he said in Matthew 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And what we're seeing in the book of Acts is his sovereign ability to mix the right things together in order for his church to go forward. For example, in the passage that we just read, we see many, many miracles being done of different kinds to different people kind of an amazing uh, occurrence of what happened there as people were running through the, or walking through the streets. Uh, apparently there was this idea that, the, that just the shadow of Peter would heal them. That passage, by the way, the passage does not indicate that that is necessarily true. That's just what they, they, in, they, they thought perhaps was true. But many people were being healed. There were lots of miracles that were going on. But also there was, there was some suffering going on. 
there, were, there was some persecution happening. Just, just, by, just hypothetically, what do you suppose would happen if all of these miracles and all of these victories were taking place, but there was no persecution? We don't really know what would have taken place, but perhaps, perhaps the Christians would have gotten sort of spoiled. Perhaps they wouldn't have really understood the sacrifice that it requires to, to be a Christian, to follow after Christ. Perhaps the, the world, the people around, would, would not realize the, the true nature of the gospel, that there is a cost to accepting the gospel. And maybe the people around would have thought that this was just a, a place of prosperity only. And if you join this thing, you'll get miracles done and you, all this wonderful thing will happen. We don't really know, but what we do know is that God is sovereign and Christ is all-knowing and, and sovereign over his church. And he is able to mix things in a way that sovereignly it comes out where the gospel is able to move forward through this church at Jerusalem, where many people are saved, where there, is great, there are miracles being done in the name of Christ, where Christ is greatly glorified and that his power can only be attributed to, to his power to what has occurred in the deliverance of, of his people. A lot is going on to glorify God, but it's mixed with suffering. It's mixed with persecution. It's mixed with what we would deem as difficult, bad things or hurdles to go over. Well, as we look at this passage, we're going to see just exactly how this all works. And my prayer is that we'll be able to, to leave with this great hope of what God is doing and what Christ is continuing to do in his church and also to realize how we can persevere through the difficulties in our lives as well to stay focused on the preaching and the living out of the gospel message for, for people. You'll, requ- you'll recall from last week, uh, we, we learned about Ananias and, S- and Sapphira. We learned how uh, they had lied against the Holy Spirit when they had lied to the congregation, the assembly there in the church. I think we have to remember something about that context. When I've read this passage in the past and just gone through the passage in the past in verses 1 through 11, I've, I, I, never th- I, don't th- I think I always pictured the whole scene with Ananias and Sapphira, which I've known as a child, as them being, like the whole assembly being in this closed room. And everybody's in this closed room and this, this thing happened where they come down an aisle and, and or Ananias comes down first and then Sapphira comes down an aisle and he's pronounced as a liar and he dies. Uh, right there on the spot, um, and all of that happened except they weren't in a closed room. Do you know where they were? They were in, in Solomon, Solomon's portico. They were in the, in the temple, in the largest part of the temple where, there, where the public would, was able to see. So if you can imagine a, an assembly of believers gathering there, but there were many Jewish people and even Gentile people potentially because of the part where the, 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 the court where they were at, where they were at could, could go in and see all of what was happening. This was not a secret this, that this occurred in the, in the early church. And it would leave us to sort of wonder on a human perspective, well, what now? I mean, how is the church going to survive if people think that if they join it, then they might die? Can you imagine that there might be some people that would, that would assume that as they ob- observed or heard about the death of Ananias and Sapphira? And what we're going to find in this passage is, is what takes place within this context of having Ananias and Sapphira killed during this time. And with that in mind, we want to pick up in verse 12, and we're going to see some things about a purified church here. Let me make this, mention this before we get there. This is a church that God has chosen to purify. Peter has swiftly chosen to be direct in dealing with the problem, with the sin uh, in the midst there of Ananias and Sapphira, particularly because it had surfaced to a level of unrepentance and to brazen disobedience as we looked at last week. Remember a couple of weeks prior, a couple of chapters prior, we, we found the Sanhedrin had strictly told the apostles don't preach in the name of Christ. 
These are the potential hurdles that are looming on the church. And with that in mind, we want to see how this church forms, how this church surfaces as a result of what is taking place in the lives of, these, uh, of, of this assembly. We're going to see, first of all, that there is unity within in verse 12. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. What happened in the church unified the people. We would not necessarily have expected that, humanly speaking. But it indeed did. They were all in one accord. It was something that unified them. In the presence of signs and wonders, of course, we see that they are doing all kinds of miracles and things. And we'll, rec we'll recall also that the miracles were to authenticate the work of Christ, that this is the church that Christ had, has uh, inaugurated. And there are constant reminders to the unbelieving Jews that this is taking place. But what was happening there was embodying, embodying unity. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the calling with which you are called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That was happening here. If you read Ephesians chapter 4 and the one chapter prior and one chapter after, chapter 5, you're going to find that this unity was intended to be something of a great testimony uh, and would glorify God, and we're going to see that that's exactly what happens in this passage. Then we'll notice in verse 13 the response of the people that were observing this assembly. None of the rest of them dared join them. Why? Well, because of what happened in Ananias and Sapphira. No one dared join them. They were, they were scared to join them. But it also says in the passage that they greatly admired, they greatly respected them. Now, I want us to think to another passage of Scripture. Do you remember, it's actually now a year and a half ago, when we went through the Gospel of John in John chapter 2. You say, I don't remember that. I don't remember last Sunday, so I don't remember that. Um, and that's understandable. But you might know the book of John well enough to remember in John chapter 2 where, where Christ went through and cleansed the temple. And after he cleansed the temple, he began to perform some miracles. And after he performed the miracles, uh, there were some people that are, were around that it says they believed on Jesus. But in that passage in John chapter 2 verse 23, it says, And when he was in, a, in, in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast... Many believed in the name when they saw the signs which he did, but Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. He didn't, they believed, but it wasn't a saving kind of faith. It wasn't a true belief in Jesus. And we find later on in John chapter 6 a little bit more of why that took place. In that passage, Jesus was feed, had fed the 5,000, he was feeding people, and there were miracles being done, and they come to him, and they're following him now. But they're not following him for the reason that you might think. They're following him for a different reason, and Jesus actually wants to escape from them because they're following for the wrong reason. They finally catch up to him, they find out where he is, and they say in verse 25 of John chapter 6, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which uh, perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of God will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. So their response to unfettered miracles without any kind of, of church to show how this all works was that they wanted to follow him, but they wanted to follow Christ for the wrong reason in John chapters, one, uh, John chapters 2 and 6. You don't really have that problem here because now what you have is an assembly of believers who are now modeling what it looks like to be a Christian. And along with being part of, of God's plan and being part of the gospel and, being, and knowing and seeing what God is doing in their midst and seeing even all the miracles that are being done and even having miracles done to them, there is this other thing like that they have to be holy. 
There is this accountability within the body of believers that, that are clearly there, that is clearly there from, from the passage that we just looked at from Ananias and Sapphira. And, and people are now a little more cautious. They're sort of like, okay, well, I like the miracles, but I don't like this idea of being put to death by God if I, if I, if I don't do what I need to do. Of course, we talked at, at length about what that looks like and how it's not a matter of just sinning. And it's not a matter of just sinning even once or twice or many times for that matter. We all do that. But when we are just continually unrepentant about our sin, we don't, we are, we don't have sorrow for our sin. It's going to surface to a point where it affects the entire body, and then, uh, then there are consequences uh, after that. They didn't understand all this, but they basically were kind of keeping their distance. But at the same time, there was this respect that was, that was due, that was given to these people. And that is another result of what occurs. There was this high esteem given to them. Luke uses this word primarily in other places to demonstrate m- magnifying the Lord. The same word that is used here is translated magnify in Luke 1.46 with reference to the Lord, as well as Acts 10.46 and Acts 19.17. Those three places, there it's magnifying the Lord. This place, it's magnifying the people. I don't necessarily think that it's, it's saying that that's wrong here in this passage, but simply that these people were looking from the outside, and they, they did not want to be part of it, but there was this respect You'll notice then in verse 14 that there were genuine conversions. Now catch this. On the one hand, there were a group of people that absolutely did not want to be a part of this assembly. But God, in his, in his, in his intervening sovereign work, is not going to keep from saving people. He's going to save people, verse 14. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women. So they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them in in beds and couches. So you see there that there are these genuine, sincere conversions. You know, I really think that oftentimes in our Christianity and our witnessing to others, sometimes we are so focused on being liked that we're not really respected. In fact, there seems to be sometimes in churches and us as individuals, we will, we will, we will think that if we are just liked enough, then maybe that person will be wooed to Christ. They'll be convinced to come to Christ. And we'll even compromise being respected for the sake of being liked. I've always told my kids, I said, it is more important to be respected than to be liked. And it's something to remember. You know, as a Christian, there are going to be times where we're not liked. And everybody wants to be liked. If I had, if I had a show of hands of people that don't want to be liked, I, I, I don't think that anybody would raise their hand. Now, some of you might not care that much. Uh, I would probably have a few hands that wouldn't care that much. But, um, but as far as actually wanting to be liked or not wanting to be liked, I mean, most of us want to be liked, but folks, we've got to be careful. Because in the body of Christ, as a church and as individuals, sometimes we have to take a stand and do right and say what needs to be said, even if it risks not being liked, knowing that, that God will do his work in the way that he needs to do his work, even if for a while we're not liked in the process. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should be ornery. I'm not suggesting that we should find a way to be disliked. But what I am saying, folks, is that sometimes we need to, as Peter did in the previous passage, he took a stand for right. He dealt with what he needed to to deal with. And as a result, the body of Christ continued to be a light, a holy testimony before unbelievers. And some didn't like them, and they didn't want to join them, but they sure did respect them. And not only did they respect them, the Spirit of God worked in his convicting work among, among people and brought many, many souls to Christ, not because they were these people were liked or disliked, but simply the work of God in the lives of these people. It ought to give us great encouragement to realize that. It ought to help us to understand that and to 
give us a sense of courage to say what needs to be said, to do what's right, not in pride or arrogance, always in humility and love, but sometimes love must be tough. Sometimes things need to be said in order to be said. And we need to remember that both as individuals and as a body of Christ. And folks, we as a church ought never compromise holiness in order to try to woo someone to the gospel. And the reason that we ought to be careful about that is that when we do that, we are, we are wooing to them to something that is not right. It is, it, is, it is compromised rather than pure and true. And we see this in this passage. And I, let me mention this as well just by way of application. You obviously have grand amounts of healing going on. You've got uh, miracles happening. You've got um, people that are, that are possessed by demons. The word tormented indicates it's a, it's a permanent kind of thing that's happening there. But, but what we need to remember here is the importance of not compromising. And let me put it this way. Sometimes in our lives as Christians, we need to think in terms of God dependency rather than self-dependency. See, people that are dependent upon self to, to have the gospel penetrate a soul will likely compromise. Did you catch that? If we think that it's our, it, that we're dependent, now it's our responsibility to share the gospel, but if, if, it, if, if the winning of a soul is dependent upon us, then it's very easy for us to manipulate or to, or to change things or to, or to compromise in an area knowing or thinking that it's dependent upon us to bring someone to a saving knowledge of Christ. And we need to understand that we have absolutely no power to do that. The power is in the gospel. The power is in the spirit of God. The power is not in our ability to persuade. The power is not in our methods or our manipulation. And we've got to remember that and to understand that. But if we are dependent upon God and we realize that we're simply vessels which with the gospel is going to go forward in the way that God wants, then we will be able to avoid compromise. Now, with that in mind, we then need to move to verses 17 and 18. And to set this up correctly, I want to sort of set it this way. What we are, what we are seeing in this passage as well as previous passages is that the gospel is continuing to go forward. But there are hurdles in the way. A few weeks ago, I was, uh, we were at Ocean City and we had beautiful weather. We had the best waves for riding waves that I, I've, ever, I've ever had before at Ocean City on that, the Atlantic Ocean there. And I have been there many, many, many times in my life. Uh, and I, it's the, the best waves we've ever had. And how many of you all like to wave, ride waves? I'm curious. How many, yeah, Kristen put her hand up right away. Uh, it's, it, you know, it's kind of one of those one, one thrills in my, I'm not a very, I'm not really a thrill seeker by nature, but that one I love. I'm, I'm like, I, I'll get into that. So, so anyway, so I, we were out with our kids with, with our boogie boards and we were, and we were riding the waves. And Caitlin, um, uh, one of the things to, to, to be a really good wave rider, it's really important to find the right place to stand as the waves come over, as the, the crest comes over. And, um, and so we would find a place to stand, but, but and, and then the other thing is you gotta choose the right wave. You know the best wave is usually, uh, is usually the one right before the one that you hit. hit. But oftentimes, you'll, you'll take one, and, and we would take one and we'd just go and take it a little ways, and the one after was the one that you really wanted to, wanted to, to get on. And so you had to just wait for the right one. There was sort of a patience that needed to take, take place in order to hit the right waves. It was sort of funny. Caitlin and I had figured this out. And we started to have, there was like a group of people over here and over, over here. And I looked behind me and I realized they were all doing the, choosing the same wave that Caitlin and I were choosing. It was kind of funny. But, you know, during that time, uh, when you're trying to resist certain waves so you can get to the other ones, here's what you don't do. You don't just stand there flat-footed and just wait for the wave to hit you. What will 
happen if you just stand there flat-footed waiting for the wave to hit you? You're going to get knocked backwards. You're going to no longer be in the place you need to be for that wave that's going to, that, that you want to ride. And so it's important to know how to handle that wave. And folks, the way that you handle the wave is that you actually dive into the wave. Or you sort of push into the wave at, in, in some way so that you could remain in the same place and then catch the wave you really want to catch. And what you find with these disciples is that these folks are relentless when it comes to the gospel. They're relentless when it comes to catching the right wave, if you will, doing, staying on task, getting the right goal done, which is to preach the gospel and live out the gospel. And no matter what wave comes their way, they don't stand there flat-footed, okay, I'm just going to take it. They, they choose to deal with that particular wave in a, in a particularly wise way. And when it, whether it comes to, when it comes to blatant lying in the church like Peter, or when it comes to the arrest of these apostles that you're going to see, they're going to choose to handle it in the right way, and they're going to have divine help in this as well. And you and I are going to come, look, lie, our, our lives are full of waves. They are, there are tons of things in our lives that we constantly have to navigate correctly. And if we stand there flat-footed and just let it hit us, it's going to knock us back. But if we anticipate the wave coming, or sometimes you can't anticipate the wave coming, and you, you, you need to say, okay, how am I going to, in a right and appropriate way, handle this wave so that it doesn't knock me down so that I can get to what God wants me to do in glorifying himself and preaching and giving out the gospel. And we're going to see that now we have detractors. Here is the first wave, if you will, in this passage. Verse 17. It says, Then the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, which, the sect of the, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. It's interesting that, in, that Jesus in, in the Gospels was always dealing with the Pharisees. That's primarily because they, the Pharisees were more, more located, they had control of the area of Galilee. Now they're in Jerusalem and you'll see the Sadducees now keep popping up. One of the things that's different between the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees is that the Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection. The Pharisees did in a, in, a, in a common resurrection of God's people. The Pharisees did. The Sadducees did not. If you ever want to remember that, by the way, you could just say that the, the Sadducees did not remember a resurrection, did not believe in a resurrection. They were sad, you see. So I'm sure some of you have heard that before. But these Sadducees were opposing them. And they were, we see that they were filled with indignation, folks. The word there is envy or jealousy. Luke is going to use this word that way in several different locations. And many times Paul will use it as well. And it often is, is, is associated with the word strife. In Romans chapter 13, verse 13, it says, Let us walk properly as in a day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. 1 Corinthians 3, 3. For you are still carnal, for where there is envy, strife, and divisions. 2 Corinthians 7, 7. And not only by this coming, but also by the consolation with which he was, com uh, he was comforted when he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. You've got this concept of jealousy and envy. Now, let me ask you a question. Does that cause a problem in God's church? Are we sometimes inclined toward jealousy and toward envy? This word is the idea of guarding your turf, possessiveness, self-protection, uh, it's, it, if you think of the illustration of a bear and her cub, I was, when, when I was up in Pennsylvania, I used to like to go hiking up in the mountains. And the two things you had to watch out for up in the mountains were bears and rattlesnakes. So I would have a, back in, you know, I was up in Pennsylvania, so you could, you could I had a concealed carry permit. And, and um, you can't have those, in, well, it's hard to get in Maryland. 
So, so I had, and I'm not going to try, by the way. So um, there, there were three. Um, I would, I would fill half of the chamber with, with birdshot to get the snakes, and the other with hollow points to get the bears. But I, I, I talked to some of the people, and they always said, "Look, the bears will probably leave you alone if you see them. Just, just keep walking and don't pay attention unless you get between a bear and her cub, and then you're, you're pretty much done for. Don't even bother." Uh, if that happens, just throw the gun away and, and you'll, you'll be with the Lord soon. So, so that was, I don't think I would have done that. But so, so anyway, why? Because there is this possessive nature. As a, that's the, this idea. Except this righteous indignation, or this, it's not righteous at all, this indignation, this jealousy is actually self-protection in this case. These Sadducees are, are afraid of losing their power. They're afraid of losing their position. They're seeing all these miracles done. They're seeing all these people watching all of this. And all of these things are undeniably of divine origin. I mean, there's no way that all of these miracles could be done and, these, and, and it just be attributed to some sort of earthly power. But these Sadducees are so filled with their own jealousy, they're not able to see what God is doing. And as they, see, as they deal with all this, they decide that they're going to handle this and they're going to take, take the apostles, and they're going to arrest the apostles, and they're going to put them in, in jail. You and I need to be very careful about jealousy in the church. We need to be very uh, aware of the fact that it's God's church, that he'll do what we, he want, we want to us, and we, he wants to with us. And we never want to be blinded by jealousy so that we can't see what God is doing. We ought to want God to do great things, not just in our church, but other gospel preaching churches in this area. We ought to want the Lord to, to really work uh, through other churches in this area, not just ours. And we ought to be very, very uh, prayerful about that. We ought to want the gospel to go forward in this area and all over the world. And we ought to be very careful about having any kind of jealousy in that way. That it will thwart the, the gospel of Christ and it actually will blind us to seeing what God is really doing. God glorifies himself in the church also by making the church unstoppable. Now this is an amazing and kind of ironic story. So they are put in prison. And we've already read the text so far, so I'll just sort of rehearse it for you. They're put in prison and an angel of the Lord comes by night and he opens the prison doors and he lets them out. But notice what he says to them. He doesn't say, OK, just escape and go your merry way. He, he lets them out of this wave, if you will. He lets them out of this, of this problem, this hindrance. And he says, now, I want you to go back into that public square that you were in, in that temple, in the Solomon. Go back and continue to preach and to teach the word of God. Do you see that in the passage? It's amazing. I mean, he is, we, they're so relentless that the gospel has got to continue to go forward. Verse, um, we see this uh, picking up here in uh, verse 17. And the high priest rose up and um, all the world, verse 18. And they laid their hands upon the apostles and put them in the common prison. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened, and opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with him came and call, called the council together with all the elders of, of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. So, so the rest of the story is this, just very basically. They're let out of prison. They go and they begin to preach the word. In a public place, the, they send, the, the council sends people back to see what is taking place, to, to get the prisoners so that they can stand trial again. And the prisoners are gone. The, the soldiers are there. The, the door is locked. It appears from the text that the soldiers didn't even know that their prisoners were missing. It's kind of what it looks like anyway. And they're just surprised by this. But their response to this is quite interesting. Their response is, what will, what will become of this? 
Now, if, if that happened to you, you're, you're the captain of the guard, you go over and you see, and the prisoners, you know, the prisoners are gone, and it, the door's locked, the guards are there, what, would the, what question would you ask? You would immediately ask this question. You would say, how what? How did this happen? That would be the question you would ask. That's not the question they ask. They don't ask, how did this happen? They say, oh no, what is going to happen because of this? What ramifications are going to occur? How are we going to lose more of our power, more of our glory, more of our control? They're just so focused on themselves. They can't even see that this is God doing this. Now, it's interesting that an unsaved Jewish leader is going to have to straighten them out later on, Gamaliel. And Gamaliel is going to have to say to them, hey, if this is God, we ought to be careful. We'll see that next week. But understand that, there is the, that all of what God is doing here is to continue to glorify himself. They, it is undeniable that, that the, even the arrest of these Sadducees is not going to be able to thwart the plan of God and the gospel that, uh, of going forth. Now that brings us to some application here that I just want to mention to us. When we go through troubles and trials and suffering and difficulty, do we keep the goal in mind? Do we remember that our goal is for the continuance of the gospel? And I could just tell you from personal experience that when my mom passed away, and I, every once in a while I'll bring her up, you know, people ask me why did, um, why did um, uh, how, how did you get through that? How did you, how did you go through all of that? And this is not something that you can tell somebody right away. But the way that I got through that probably, it is just personally, I mean, there were a lot of things, but one of the main things is I, I, needed to stay, I needed to stay on task of what God wanted me to do in my life. I needed to get through that wave to penetrate. First of all, I knew my mother would want me to do that. Most importantly, I, I knew that, my, that the Lord would want me to do that. God does not want us to be rendered inoperative by these things that occur in our lives. He wants us, and, and frankly, the way that we get through them is to realize that there's something on the other side that we must persevere toward. We must do. And God will help us get there as long as we don't just stand flat-footed and just let the thing hit us. We've got to realize that we get through this for the sake of the gospel. And that the gospel is worth us getting through it. And at times in our lives when it seems like nothing else is going right, we've got to remember that. There was a, a lady named Ida Skripnikova, I practiced this and still got it wrong. Ida Skripnikova was, his name, was her name. Ida was, a, was born in 1941 in Leningrad when the, when the Russian people were fighting free, to free themselves uh, from the Axis invaders. She was one who was, uh, of course, the enemy was driven out, as we know, from second, the, the Second World War, but that didn't stop everything in Russia from happening. It didn't, it didn't free, really bring true freedom to those people. In 1961, Ida came to know Christ at age 19. Ida uh, wanted to, as a result, just by impulse, share her faith with others. And so she purchased a, group, a bunch of postcards with a beautiful picture on them of a sunrise. And she, and I'm going to give you, a, I'll just read a, an excerpt from the poem that she put on the back of these postcards. She said, what awaits you, my friend, beyond the grave? Answer this question while light remains. Perhaps tomorrow, before God, you will appear to give an answer for everything. Think deeply about this. For you are not on this earth forever. Perhaps tomorrow you will break forever your links uh, with the world. Seek God while he is to be found. She took this poem along, uh, that was an excerpt from it. She took that poem and put it on the back of a postcard and she began to stand in the public square and it began to, she began to hand these out. And of course, uh, she was very quickly arrested. In April of 1962, she was tried by the communist court. She was exiled to Leningrad, 
grad, she lost her job as a lab assistant. But after she was uh, disciplined, she went back out and she again began to ha hand these postcards out and to witness to people. She was arrested again in 1965 and was sent to a labor camp for a year. After the year was over, she was released, and you know what she did again? You guessed it. In 1968, again she was arrested, and she was sent to a labor camp for three more years. Here is a woman who was absolutely relentless. She was going to share her faith with others, and she wasn't going to, take, going to let a measly thing like a, a labor camp stop her. She was absolutely convinced that that was her goal, that that was her purpose, that that was what she needed to do, and she wasn't going to allow distractions in her life, and she was going to be relentless in her pursuit. And frankly, a lot of things in our lives, when it boils down to what we need to do and how we get through things as a Christian, certainly it is a comfort to know that God is with us, and we need to remember that. And certainly it is important for us to realize uh, that, that, that he is there and that he is our hope. But folks, when it comes to the practical nitty-gritty of life, we need to remember those things, and those are going to be our sustaining strength. But when it comes to what do we do, well, folks, we need to continue to serve God. We need to focus on God. We need to focus on his purpose, his plan, his mission, what he wants us to do. We need to be motivated in those ways. And folks, if we're motivated on that, we're looking at that wave. We're looking at the, the right crests, the right kind of wave that we're going to be able to carry. And the wave that comes before it, we're going to dive through it to get to the right wave. And that is the wave of giving out the gospel. And with all of this in mind, I'd like us just to reflect on three basic conclusions. One is we must t stand firm in the truth, knowing that we will not always be liked. But God will use us as he sees fit. We must stand firm in the truth, knowing that God will use us as he sees fit. This is a great encouragement to us. I mean, uh, you, you would have thought that things were ruined in this church, but that was not the case. God was going to, going to continue to work, and the Spirit of God was continue to save souls. Number two, we must always be mindful of the sin of jealousy. It is poison to God's church. And number three, we must relentlessly pursue opportunities to teach the gospel. God will preserve his church but whatever means, by whatever means, he chooses. God will pres preserve his church by whatever means he chooses. We must relentlessly pursue opportunities to teach the gospel. Let me just mention this as well. Three times in this passage, you've got this word teach. It's the word didaskalos. That is different than the word preach. When we think of preaching the gospel or giving out the gospel, Sometimes we think only in terms of, okay, well, I need to just give, you know, three sentences. I need to just sort of blurt out something about Jesus and I've preached the gospel. But folks, that is actually not the emphasis here in this passage. These apostles were breaking the gospel down. They were teaching it. They were disseminating. They were going through the various aspects of the, of the gospel. They were looking at Old Testament truths. They were communicating those Old Testament truths in light of New Testament reality. They were, they were teaching it. They were instructing the people. Even before people came to Christ, there was this emphasis on instructing with the details of the gospel. Now, the gospel is simple, folks. But the gospel must be taught. It, there must be instruction. There must be a breaking down of the gospel message so that it can be understood, so that it can be grasped, so that we don't run into this sort of, sort of I issue where we're just, just speaking to a genie or rubbing the lamp of a genie and expecting God to save us because we did some sort of hocus pocus. No, to avoid that, we've got to really teach the gospel and instruct in the gospel. Very important for us to understand that truth as well. We must be relentless in gospel pursuit. And now we have the opportunity to proclaim the gospel to others 
with the Lord's Supper. That's actually what we're doing. We are in unity one with another demonstrating that we are Christ's and that we are believing the gospel together and that we are joining together in that way. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll give you a time of silence before the Lord and then we will partake together. Father, we do come to you and we ask, Lord, as we enter into our communion time, may we, dear Father, just focus on the truths of the gospel. May it be a time where we realize just how, um, just how amazing your love is that you would send your own son to pay the punishment for our sins, that he would take on our sin on himself. And in exchange for our sin, he would pay the punishment for it and give us his righteousness so that we could be declared righteous by you. And Father, as we enter into this time, I pray that we would be able to put away for a few moments the distractions that invade our minds and help us Lord, truly to focus on Christ. We praise these things in Christ's name. Amen.